Healing Unlimited. Hello, Americans. This is Orson Welles. This radio show is brought to you by the men and women of Lockheed and Vega. Our script tonight was written for us by the distinguished American novelist, John Steinbeck. It's the story of a flyer and a flyer's mother. It's the story of the training of a flyer and of the prescience of a mother's love, which is older than the flight of birds. And now we continue with John Daly in CBS World News. General MacArthur's headquarters tonight issued a communique reporting the sinking of an 8,000-ton Jap cargo ship in the Bismarck Sea. This morning, reports told of an Allied raid on Jap shipping in Rabaul Harbor. Flying fortresses sank or seriously damaged... Good morning, Mom. You're late. Sit down and eat your breakfast. You'll be late for school. It's Saturday. You forgot the day. Oh, what am I thinking of? Of course it is. Your eggs are a little overdone. Now, how did I think it was Friday? I've lost a day somewhere. Thinking about something else, I guess. I'll go. Good morning. Take it out of your pocket. I know what it is. Oh, it's just an advertisement. It's from Carl. Give it to me. I've been expecting it. You think you are a fortune teller. Why, I guess I am sometimes. Give me Carl's letter. Read it. Come on, read it. Just a moment. Turn that down, will you? Um, dear Mother and Dad and Jimmy, I'm sorry I don't write more and more often. Fact is, they keep us so busy there isn't much time to write. We have been seeing a little action, and I guess we'll see more. I was lucky the other day, and I have a citation... I'm going to send it to you, not to brag, but so you can keep it for me until I get back. And a medal? Will you get a medal, too? I went away. I don't know. I got your letters Saturday. They came through quickly. There's not much to tell, except that I am well and busy. I hope you are, too. I'll write again soon when I have more to tell. Love to you all, Carl. He don't tell anything. He never tells anything. That's the same letter he writes me every time. I've got all of them. I'll write again soon when I have more to tell. Why don't he say what's happening? Why, he does. What's happening, then? He's well and busy. Carl's pretty lucky. He's old enough. When I'm old enough, I'm going in, too. Of course you will. Mother, when we get his citation, can I take it to school? Oh, he might not like that. Why do you want to? Well... Nobody around here ever thought Carl was so brave. He isn't brave. What? He isn't brave at all. Why, when he went in... Come on, line up, line up. All right, you men. Cutting the shots next. Hurry up, next man. All right, hold out your arm. Watch it. Whoop, catch him, somebody. Lay him out. He'll come to in a minute. Next man. Hold out your arm. There we are. Next man. He fainted that day. He was afraid of the needle. But the next day, when he took his typhoid shot, he didn't faint. Maybe fear is the foundation of courage. Well, he he must have been pretty good. No. He wasn't neat. He never put his clothes away. Just a minute. Carter, haven't you learned to make a bunk yet? Oh, yes, sir. You call that a square corner? But I was Remake that bunk and do it until it's right. Yes, sir. He hated to be bossed. He used to sulk at home when he was told what to do. And he was never on time for anything. What time he got, Carl? Uh, it's uh, 10.30. Oh, clock up there must be fast. Oh, my gosh. My watch has stopped. watch was stopped. It's a very silly excuse, Carter. But my watch was stopped, sir. In the Air Force's watches do not stop. There are no wrong watches. You will walk post for three hours with seat parachutes, and you will think over this curious fact. In the Air Force's, 
Watchers are always right. But he's a good flyer, all right. Look at his citation. He was frightened. Not afraid, but frightened when his instruction began. He couldn't control his hands. Don't freeze to that stick. You'll break it off. Now, right turn. Stick and run up. Easy, they work together. That's good. Now hold it. All right, straighten out. And stop strangling that stick. His heart swelled up until he could hardly breathe. He didn't think he'd ever learn. He sat on his bunk and he thought he might resign to keep from being washed out. And all the time he was afraid someone would find out how frightened he was. But he finished. He got his wings. He flies a P-40. I hope. He's got a medal. Yes, he can fly. Every protesting nerve is hammered into place. Hands that wanted to do wrong things, trained and tempered to do right things. Hours, long, lovely hours. Turning and climbing, diving, flying formation, until it's deep back in his brain. So deep that he doesn't even have to think about it. The hands and heart and nerves, all part of one thing of which the ship is the other part. I wonder if you'd rather be in Africa than Australia. I'd rather be in Africa. That's the place to be. The squadron got its orders in the afternoon. We will proceed to a port of embarkation this afternoon. And you will be on restriction for some time... Prior to departure. That night. His last night. He wrote a long, long letter home. Ten pages. He wrote down all his fears. His wondering whether he'd ever come back. He was on a knife edge in time. And tipping into a world and a life he'd never known. Ten pages he wrote. And he tried to tell us that he loved us and that he was afraid. He tried to set for all time and for all himself what he was in the world and what his life was. He wrote about death and about fear. And when he'd finished ten pages, he read them and burned them. He wrote... We've got our moving orders. I am well and terribly busy. I'll write soon when I get to where I'm going. I'll give you all the dope. Love to you all. I wonder what he did to get his medal. Oh, that was luck. The luck that comes from nerve and muscles forged and hammered into the mold of the job to be done. He was going home. He came out of a cloud and there were two zeros below and ahead of him. It was just luck. He got the first one before they knew he was there. The other one turned and dived. Carl saw the pilot look over his shoulder. He could see his face looking over his shoulder. He saw the face in his sight. And the face disappeared. That was luck. Golly. Yesterday wasn't luck. Yesterday? The field is small. The jungle comes close in all around, and the tin quarters are hidden under trees. And the field is camouflaged, and the ships are pulled up under the trees. All in correctly. Rendezvous with B-I-T-E's at R4-1432. CGT. Get us escort. Take off at 1502 CGT. Understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hey, I wonder if any beer came in. They met the bombers over the sea and on the way to the target. They hadn't far to go, for they were near, and the bombers had come far. They 
They flew along the green coast, and they could see the white surf piling up on the sand. There was green water, and farther out, blue water below them. And little puffs of clouds were in the sky, and far down the coast, a thunderhead. Black with white edges. They saw the harbor and the fire and the ships flying in the bay. The bombers made their run and the bombs went out. Then the zeros came out of the thunderhead. And Carl didn't have the luck this time. He turned to attack. And as he climbed, he felt a shock. And the controls were heavy in his hands. He knew he couldn't fight. He strained about to run for it. And... His motor was killed. Then what? Then what? He rolled clear and fell. And his hand went up to the parachute release. But he didn't pull it. I thought he'd never pull it. But he knew better. He was very near the water when he pulled the ripcord. And his body jerked. And he floated into the sea. And a zero came down after him and ripped the water with its guns. He dove and stayed under until his blood beat in his ears. <sighs> then it was over. And he got his belt inflated. He saw one of his squadron go over and wag his ship at him. hours in the water before they picked him up. Hey, you all right? Yeah, I, I... I guess so. Yeah, pretty lucky I found you. Current carried you away from where you landed. Yeah, grab hold. Yeah, you're pretty pooped. Here, I'll, I'll give you a hand. Was he all right? Was he hurt? He was all right. Mother? Say, Mother, how do you know all this? I was there every minute. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard a story written for us by John Steinbeck. An old Mercury actress, Betty Gard, played and played, we think, very beautifully, the part of the mother. And with her in the cast were Everett Sloan, Carl Frank, Charles Cantor, Peter Donald, Frank Reddick, and Larry Robinson. Please join us next week. Thank you. Good night, Americans. This program was brought to you by the Lockheed and Vega Aircraft Corporations of Burbank, California. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.